This is a video on diuretics, their mechanisms of actions, and the effects on blood chemistry. The entire video is summarized by these effects on blood chemistry, but we're going to work through each of these categories of diuretics and try to work out where on the nephron they act and maybe make sense of the mechanisms that lead to these blood chemistry changes. Let's start by coloring everything, and we're going to color code each category of diuretic and also color code them as we talk about them. The first one is loop diuretics in green. We know that the green one is going to have a mechanism that acts on this channel here. So loop diuretics, like furosemide, act on the sodium-potassium chloride co-transporter in the loop of Henle. That's represented by this arrow in this box here. When they inhibit that transporter, they're going to decrease sodium chloride reabsorption from this site. This increases sodium delivery to the collecting tubules later in the nephron, and that's going to later increase the sodium reabsorption by the principal cells here. When that happens, when the sodium that you failed to reabsorb here ends up being resorbed later in the nephron, you end up having to balance that by potassium and hydrogen ion efflux to preserve electroneutrality. This results in a low serum potassium and a low serum hydrogen, leading to a high pH, and that's what we see in our summary table here. There's also indirect effects on the resorption of magnesium and calcium as well, and you can think of your decreased absorption of those as having the same effect for preserving electroneutrality. The next diuretic class is thiazide diuretics, like hydrochlorothiazide. This blocks the sodium chloride co-transporter in the distal tubule, shown in this box here, which then has a similar effect to the loop diuretics. So if you're blocking the sodium chloride co-transporter here, you're again going to reabsorb less sodium, and you're going to have increased potassium excretion later on in the nephron. Again, you're going to have to balance, for electroneutrality, you're going to have to balance this by increased potassium and hydrogen ion efflux, which again leads to a low serum potassium and a low serum hydrogen ion content, meaning you again have a high pH. Um, this also has an indirect effect on the reabsorption of magnesium and calcium. However, in this case, your calcium ends up high. The mechanism for why your calcium ends up high doesn't, isn't completely well elucidated. It has something to do with the hyperpolarization of the cell membranes, which activates voltage-gated calcium channels, leading to hypercalcemia. So because of this effect, hydrochlorothiazide and other thiazide diuretics have actually been used for hypocalcemia and for nephrolithiasis. If you end up with a higher serum calcium, that means you're going to have low calcium in your urine, which uh, is one of the main constituents of kidney stones. So if you have less calcium in your urine, you'll have less of a chance of growing those kidney stones. So HCTZ can be used for nephrolithiasis. There's also a link between HCTZ and other thiazide diuretics and uric acid in the blood. So uh, this causes high calcium in the blood. It also causes high uric acid in the blood. So it could precipitate gout attacks. The next diuretic that's worth talking about is the potassium sparing diuretics. Now there are two big categories of these. One of them blocks epithelial sodium channels that includes amelioride and triamterene. The other category blocks mineral corticoid receptors that includes spironolactone and eplerinone. These act in the distal um, collecting tubule and they end up blocking sodium transport in the collecting ducts. So it's in yellow here. You can see the effects on the blood chemistry here. And the mechanism, the downstream mechanism that it causes, is indicated here with these yellow Xs. You're going to have less potassium efflux, and you're going to have less hydrogen ion efflux, leading to a low pH. Um, in the other cases, you had increased hydrogen ion efflux, leading to a high pH. In this case, you now have decreased hydrogen ion efflux, leading to a low pH in the blood. Lastly, we have acetazolamide. This is an enzyme uh, blocker that blocks the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. So carbonic anhydrase usually makes a proton gradient. It usually uh, combines water and carbon dioxide to make H2CO3, which can then dissociate into bicarb and hydrogen ions. And it also does the reverse of that reaction. When you don't have carbonic anhydrase working due to acetazolamide, you can't make this proton gradient that increases your hydrogen ion secretion into the proximal tubule. So you're unable to secrete hydrogen ions into the proximal tubule here. This prevents the reabsorption of sodium chloride and bicarb in the proximal tubule. So you're going to have decreased reabsorption of these ions because you have decreased secretion of hydrogen ions. 
because you have decreased secretion of hydrogen ions, you end up with more hydrogen ions in the body, which leads to a metabolic acidosis. So you have a low pH yet again. An indirect mechanism is that later on you're going to have potassium secretion in the collecting ducts, so that's why you end up with a lower potassium. I hope this review of diuretic mechanisms of actions was helpful, and thank you for listening.